Take Darwin's well-known survival of the fittest. How do you interpret it? That if you want to survive, you must be the strongest. Beat the competition or lose, right? Portraying Darwin's phrase as a story of intense competition has led us to believe that in order to survive and thrive, we must exploit other organisms and minerals that surround us. Well, this is one possible interpretation. But what if there is another way to interpret survival of the fittest? What if harsh competition is not really how nature works? What if, rather than compete, there's something else we can do to survive and thrive? I'm a plant biologist. And I brought this oregano plant with me to prove it. <laughs> For the past nine years, I was exposed to the different aspects of plant growth and the resilience of nature. In the field of molecular biology, we have created amazing tools that are very beneficial for humanity. For example, vitamin A deficiency causes death and blindness for hundreds of thousands of people every year in developing countries. Using molecular biology tools has enabled us to make precise changes in the genome of rice, creating rice enriched with vitamin A precursor, preventing this dangerous deficiency. That's happening now, and that's powerful. The problem starts, however, when we're using these same molecular tools to create a win for us humans over nature. We might find that over time, we're paying an increasingly high price. Take herbicides. In agriculture, we spray our crops with herbicides to protect them from competition. But these herbicides can also be damaging the crops themselves. So we designed crops to be resistant to herbicides. Now the crops which we choose to grow remain, while other plants will probably die. But as time passes, some of these plants adapt and also become resistant to herbicides. So how do we react? We spray more herbicides, and nature once again adapts. The cost of trying to maintain our advantage increases, and this fuels the concept of competition, deepening the divide between men and nature. I'd like to offer a different approach. When we're looking around us, nature reveals its secret ingredient to us. Nature itself shows us the best way to survive and thrive is not competition, but mutualism. In 1876, a Belgian biologist coined the term mutualism, describing the mutual aid between different species in the natural environment. It is an interaction where each organism is vital in some way to the lives of other organisms around it. Now, we're all familiar with the interaction between bees and flowers. The bees are attracted to the flower's nectar. They feed on it. And the flowers get their pollen dispersed by the bees. That's how nature works. As a matter of fact, as we're sitting here, all around us and inside us, many species live in close proximity to one another. And their ability to find just the right place next to their neighbor is what nature excels at. Nature shows us how to survive by working with, rather than competing against. So here it is. The other way to interpret survival of the fittest which does not include competition. See, in nature, survival of the fittest is not about competition. It's about fitting in. For the past 20 years, I've traveled the world, leading groups of travelers to different places around the globe. I've studied and witnessed the wisdom of indigenous nations toward nature and their place in it. These vast grasslands stretch from Mongolia to Central Asia. 
It's a huge territory, home to several ethnic groups. Climates in winter are harsh. And every time I get here in summertime, I bend down and touch the soil and feel the grass just to get connected again to the place. The grass is an essential component for the locals' economy. That's food for herds of cattle, sheep and horses and many more. They rely on it. These people perceive themselves as part of a rich, natural world where many species interact. And humans, humans are just one more component. And this deep understanding drives the herders to observe and connect to their environment in a very intimate way, enabling their herds to thrive on fresh grass every year without disturbing the balance of this delicate ecosystem. So we can live in balance with the environment, but mutualism enables us to do more. Research shows that we can create additional spaces that are home for more creatures. So by creating new ecological niches, we can increase the diversity around us. Mutualism enables us not only to balance, but also to contribute to the environment in a way, to better fit in. And I think the best example for that is this desert area in the south of Morocco. The high mountains of the Atlas Range prevent clouds from entering here, leaving these lands very dry. The locals who've settled here had to adjust to harsh conditions. They planted trees and dug wells and divert water to their fields. And in a slow process, this beautiful oasis was created. The date trees cope well with high salinity, so usually they're the first to grow. And as they grow, they provide shade. Sitting underneath one of these trees in a hot summer day is truly a divine experience, and I recommend you to try it one day. But more importantly, they provide shade for other trees and more crops as well. And once you add water into this equation, you start attracting more birds, insects, different microbes in the soil, all residing in this partially man-made piece of nature. See, not only do the locals fit in with their environment, but they create additional spaces that are home for other species. So now, let's talk about the city. Where can we find mutualism in this competitive urban environment of ours? When we look at this picture, we usually see the wooden bench and the kid next to it, which is nice. We can also think about a nice place to take the dog out for a walk. But we've been missing out on the party, partially hidden here, are thousands of species above and below ground. Just imagine for a moment all those seeds residing in the soil waiting for the right moment to wake up. Plants and trees interact with different insects and birds. Fungi recycle organic material residing in the soil, connecting all the trees in the picture in a secret underground web, enabling trees to communicate with one another to transfer food between one and the other. Some bacteria residing in the roots of plant, they provide the plant with nitrogen, that's food. And in return, they receive sugars from the plant. That's mutualism under our nose. Think about it next time you go outside. And this beautiful and complex ecosystem creates a shield for us against extreme weather conditions. It provides you and me with the fresh air we breathe, we can enjoy peaceful moments of walk in the park and even grow our food in some cases. Many of the interactions which maintain it alive are mutualistic, and we can be a part of it. Now remember Darwin, it's not the strongest to survive, it's those who fit in. So how do we fit in with the urban environment? How do we implement mutualism in our cities? 
sounds complicated. That's why I brought this oregano plant with me. I'm growing it in my urban garden for the last year or so, and we're using it when we're cooking. It's quite easy. Think simple. Grow one or two herbs you use for cooking on your terrace. Find out how to attract birds to your area. Join a communal garden and grow some of your food on your own. Learn about urban ecology in the area you live in. Understand how you can compost your organic leftovers from the kitchen. That's so important. And of course, spread the message of mutualism by sharing this talk. Now, each of these small actions can create a tremendous impact on you and the people around you, as it will enable us to be a part of this majestic ecosystem and not just casual bystanders. Our cities can become an urban oasis where many more species interact around us. Architects will design more buildings such as this one. These are new ecological niches that we're creating. They filter our air, reduce the temperature around us, and help restore the balance with the environment. Our climate is changing, and the stable conditions which allow the flourishing of our culture are disintegrating. Changing the interaction with our environment is the biggest thing we can do now. You see, as long as we compete, we'll continue destroying these majestic worlds. As long as we perceive competition as the way, we will continue choosing those solutions that have led us to the edge of the abyss. But once we adapt mutualism, we will naturally seek those solutions that help us to better fit in. Mutualism, not competition, between man and nature might be the most prosperous path for our future on this planet. Thank you very much. <clears throat>